Um, so actually, uh, where we stopped was was um, we were going to do some exercises. Actually, okay, now I remember. Okay, so just a quick review about what we ended up with uh, last class was when the, ch when the MOSFETs, so we're still talking about MOSFETs, when the MOSFETs become small in terms of the channel length, okay, the source and drain come close together, the electric fields ha get high, and a very important effect that happens, and the one thing you need to take away from, is that the electrons can gain kinetic energy in a high electric field. Once that happens, these so-called hot electrons can hit the crystal lattice and so on and create imperfection feedback and so on. Of course, when that happens, that destroys the mobility of the electrons. Okay, that destroys the transconductance of the MOSFET. That makes it a poorer <coughs> amplifier. Okay, so at the end of the day, the short channel MOSFETs, if you don't take care, will distort your signals. Okay, in other words, remember in the MOSFET, Always keep this picture in mind from a very abstract point of view, right? You have the source, drain, gate. Let's say you send a small signal voltage to the gate. Again, you get an amplified signal in the current. Okay? The amplification is typically independent of the frequency of the signal. Remember, it has to do with the capacitance. We talked about the high frequency of the signal. If you start degrading the channel, you will get frequency dependent uh, distortion. So what you get out will look different than that. And the, that obviously is a problem because we have millions of these resistors and each one has a little bit of a distortion, then everything will propagate and you'll just get garbage out. So we have to be very careful when you make these channels very small. And of course you can make them work by making sure that the voltage, one way of course, to reduce this effect, obviously, is to reduce the electric field, right? Because the electric field is what's giving the electrons kinetic energy. And the way to reduce electric field is we only have two things, right? Electric field is given by the applied voltage divided by the distance over which this is the channel length. Right? We're talking about the transfer to the, the transfer field. Yeah, transfer field along the flow of the carriers, okay? So of course, this is fixed from the fabrication, right? You made that small for a reason, you can't make it large. The only control you have is you can make that small. Okay, so that's one uh, trick that the designers use, lower voltage. Of course, lower voltage is nice because then you need smaller power supplies, all that kind of stuff, but you cannot go too low because you need to be above the threshold voltage, right? Right? You cannot, I'm oh, sorry, the, the drain to source is not that low, never mind. But you cannot make it too low because then you will not, you will be in the linear region, you won't be in the saturation region. Okay? Remember? DD versus IP, linear and saturates, right? Saturates when the depletion region cuts off the inversion channel. Oh yeah, whoever came in late, submit the, the quick. So remember, the picture of what that happens is that the depletion region eats into the inversion, right? So the inversion. So make sure you are uh, you have a good understanding of the physics of what those mean. Okay. Um, okay. What else over here? I think that's. Oh, of course, the other thing of, we need to keep in mind, which we didn't really talk about in great detail, is that the the gate oxide, the silicon dioxide right here, has to be made really thin. Okay, this has to do with maintaining the gate capacitance. Right? If you keep the gate oxide thick and ev scale everything else, your gate capacitance will be very low. The impedance of your signal that you put in, of this signal, will be very small. That's not good. Right? From your circuit design, you want high impedance. You want something which will not be affected by whatever signal you put in. 
You want this capacitance to be high, and the only way you can make it high is to make the gate up very thin. Very thin. Remember, capacitance goes as epsilon over the thickness of the upside, right? So that needs to scale as well. So this whole idea of scaling is a complicated issue. But of course, when that goes down, then you can have current going through, tunneling and all that stuff we talked about. Follow no diamond tunneling. Okay? So you can have leakage current from the gate, which is also a problem because you don't want this voltage to essentially create a current flow. Because if it does that, you will essentially lose some of the potential, right? You will start dropping some of the potential in the semiconductor, not just across the gate outside, which will also affect your output. You will distort your output. Okay? So these are very important issues that you need to be worried about when we get to small transistors. Okay? Now, I recommend reading the, chap the section in the text which is goes into this in much more detail. But I want you to understand this qualitatively. Okay, so now we're going to start with the... Uh, oops. Start with uh, an exercise, okay? The next most important, so take out a piece of paper, get ready, but let's talk briefly. The, the most, perhaps one of the most important effects in a short channel MOSFET is what's called grain-induced barrier low grade, okay? Uh, DIVO, this is something you will hear more and more. And it's a fairly complicated, so we won't try to understand this mathematically. <coughs> Our goal is to understand this from a very simple physical model. Okay, like understanding the physics. So I have tried to get a, whoops. Okay, I think I, let's see, okay, so there we are. So uh, first exercise, okay, I want you to draw an end channel MOSFET. Make the channel length small. So draw something like this. I'll give you, I'll, I'll get, get you started. There's a source, there's a drain, and this is your body. This L is small. Then you have oxide and then the gate. I want you to draw the zero volt apply here, and this is also zero, so it's grounded. Okay? Want you also this is zero. No voltage is applied, I think. Okay? Yeah, zero gate and drain voltage. Draw the depletion region that this looks like. Okay, so I'm going to put some uh, dopings here. So this bend channel, so actually, you guys are for me. So what should the body be? The bend channel. Yeah. Yes. So what should the source and drain be? Bend channel. Yeah. So typically it's N plus to get good contact. And also to make sure that the depletion region is mostly in the body. So now draw the depletion region. You can talk to your, let's say, discuss. Okay, so first of all, I mean, the idea is pretty straightforward, right? Uh, first, how would you approach this? I mean, you can look at the PN junctions, which we know very well. Okay, this is an N plus, this is P, that's grounded. And this, I forgot to say, this is also grounded, the body should be grounded. Okay, so this PN junction is essentially just an equilibrium, which is sitting around. So you have a depletion region, right? Because of the contact potential. And it will be mostly in the likely doped side, in the bottom. Okay, so you expect some, some sort of depletion region here. Right? Okay, so we're going to draw it like that for the time being. On this side, 
the situation is exactly the same. It's symmetric. Right? To the control efficient. Now, what happens when the channel length gets really small is that these two depletion regions start merging. Okay? Because you can imagine, right, the depletion region basically getting closer and closer at some point, they just get merged. <coughs> and that's a problem. Okay? So let's look at the next. Okay, so that's the first problem. Okay. Okay, that's a that's a problem when you make this model. But assume that it's not that small. Assume it's still like that. Okay? Now look at my second question. So now we know this so far. Okay. Now draw the depletion region with zero gate voltage and positive drain voltage. So I'm going to apply some voltage here. Okay, plus one volt, whatever. Now draw the depletion region. Okay, take take a, take about a minute and try to draw it again. Okay, so uh, what what would one expect to happen? Okay, think about this. this. This junction is now reverse biased, so the PN depletion region must increase, right? So you expect this boundary to start moving as you increase the voltage. Okay, so this problem happens even if the channel is not super small. You can even, by applying a voltage here, you can have that happen. The two depletion regions meet. Okay? When the two depletion regions meet, you have what's called rain induced barrier low risk. So let me see if I have, okay. So what happens to the depletion regions as the drain voltage is increased? I gave you the answer. Right? As you, as a, as you increase the drain voltage, this gets more and more reverse bias. Forget the gate for the time being. This depletion region essentially extends, right? Gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it meets the other side. Okay. Now let's think about what that means. Okay, let me see if I have another. Okay, I don't. Okay. So why is this a problem, first of all? Let's yeah? It is uh, not pinch up because we haven't applied. Okay, let's apply a gate because that we have. So, that, so we can apply a gate voltage. What what voltage should it be? Negative or positive? And channel. Positive. Yes. Okay. 
If you apply path decay voltage, let's say above the threshold, so you create an inversion there. Now, what's the problem? <coughs> when the drain is zero, we do a touch. Come on, say something. But it's okay. If you make a mistake, it's okay. That's how you learn. The current, yeah, let's think about this. The current is determined by the channel. Right? That's where the free carrier is at. The depletion region is nothing but fixed ions, right? They are whatever. In, in this case, they are phosphorus ions, the same ions. But the issue is that by having a drain voltage here, where the depletion region extends to here, now the drain voltage can affect the depletion of the source side. Okay? Which means now you can look at the channel potential. Okay? We could look at the drop of the channel potential. You can see the drain applied voltage will affect the channel potential over here, which wasn't the case before. Okay. Which means that you essentially have a situation like pinch up. It's called punch through. Okay, so you can have a saturation situation which is a problem because that means that your drain voltage will affect your amplification factor, which you do not want to have. Okay. Let me say that again. So the input current versus voltage. So in a linear region, you have some sort of saturation. If, and, and for different gate voltages, you have that. This transconductance, <coughs> how the saturation changes, is independent of the drain voltage. Right? It's Vg minus Vt, essentially. Yes? Oh, sorry. Right? This transconductance, remember, proportional to something like Vg minus Vt, or the square of that, depending on upon the situation. Right? Short channel is just Vg minus Vt. There's no dependence on drain. That's how you want it. Okay? But once you have a situation like this, this, we are not going to do the math, but this will have a dependence on the drain voltage, which is a problem because drain voltage should be just a bias going from amplification to linear to cutoff. It shouldn't really affect the transconductance. And a simple way to think about it, if you have millions of transistors, you will have to make sure that every drain voltage on every single transistor is identical. That's very difficult to do. Otherwise, you will have random variations in your transconductance. Okay, so, yes. So with your graph there, then it ends up, um, if, if the depletion region is touching, then it ends up so that those lines are sloped. At the, the, this, yeah. yes, exactly. So it's not. Uh, not just slope, they will, this transconductance will depend on what the drain voltage is, which means it's slope, yes. Then it's okay. But, you know, remember the transconductance is what? It's partial derivative drain current with respect to the gate voltage, right? You do not want this, at least in saturation for an amplifier, you don't want this to be affected by the drain voltage. Okay. That's one way to think about it. You have an amplifier, you have an output, you have an input. The drain is nothing but a bias, just a terminal to get the current out. You don't want the terminal voltage to affect that amplification. Okay, that's what happens when you have drain-induced variables. It's a bit more complicated than this, so, um, but we don't necessarily have the time to go through the detail. But this is the way to you can think about this. So, in a very simple case. And you, we can see as the drain voltage increases, the depletion regions on one side starts encroaching into the other side, and they touch. When they touch, you have what's called punch through. Okay. Okay, and that's what gives rise to what's called drain induced parallel. So, the next exercise for you are, can you suggest some solutions to the problem? You have enough background to solve. So think about this for about 30 seconds. <coughs> How would you solve this problem if it were up to you? What, 
to the body. Okay? So the goal of mitigating this problem is to make sure that this depletion region is pushed back or somehow decrease this depletion region, right? Two ways to go. Right? If you decrease the source depletion region, this will have more of a bound. You'll have more of a chance that they won't leave. Okay? So de to decrease this depletion region, you can just look at this PN junction. Would you forward bias or reverse bias it? No, you want to decrease the depletion region. So you need to forward bias the PN junction to decrease the depletion region, right? So this is P. You want to forward bias it, you apply a positive voltage. If you apply a small positive voltage to the substrate, you can decrease that depletion region. Yeah? Why, why don't we start increasing the doping in the P region? Yes, you can do that too. That's another oh. option. It's not a great way to do it, though. What's the problem with that? Because you will end up, if, when you increase doping, there are two issues. One is you'll have scattering in the channel, right? You'll have more dopants. You try to keep this lightly doped so the inversion can be, inversion channel can have high mobility. Okay, so it'll de decrease the mobility. Yeah, so there is a trade-off. But that's a, the second approach is, uh, let's make sure everyone gets it, is if you increase the doping of the body, <coughs> Of course, all the depletion regions will go down, right? Because remember, the depletion region is concentration of uh, ions times the uh, sorry, the charge in the depletion region. Charge in the depletion region is essentially the concentration of the dopants, which in this case are receptors, negative ions, times the volume of the depletion region, right? Area times the thickness. Okay, and you're trying to decrease the thickness. You need to keep that the same, right? Uh, one approach is to make that larger. You can increase the doping to decrease that. The product has to be the same. Okay, that's one way to do it, but there are challenges. Yes? Um, another similar thought, you could try decreasing the concentration of the end. Uh, let's see. At least a little bit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you, let's think, if you decrease the, con oh, so you uh, want to have the depletion mean two here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's another way to do it too. The problem with that, of course, is what? You need to have met met metal contacting this semiconductor. You need to make sure it's an ohmic contact. And you need to reduce the contact resistance. So if you start decreasing that, you will get potential drops here, which is very bad, actually. The same imagine if you have millions of these transistors connected in series, and you have a tiny drop there. 1001 will drop there. Multiply that by a million. At some point, you'll get a huge drop, right? The last transistor will not even power on. What if, what if you um, slowly went from a, or relatively slowly went from an end, uh, Yes, that's a good, that's a very good suggestion. In fact, that's one of the things people try to do, is have what's called a graded junction, okay? So they do an N plus right where the contact is, and then they grade the, well, it's usually done over here. They make this N plus, and they slowly decrease the doping concentration out here. So people can do, do all kinds of tricks once you get to the fabrication phase. 
Of course, then the question becomes economic. <coughs> The more steps you include into fabrication, then it becomes more expensive, and then you have to justify it. But that's a good, good suggestion. Okay? But uh, make sure you're able to follow the logic and understand drain-induced barrier lowering, at least from the qualitative picture. Very important. Okay, sleep. Of course, another way to understand it is from the energy band diagram. Okay? So on the top here is essentially what we looked at. So just to review. Okay, we have the, the, the blue is the long channel MOSFET where you have the depletion region over here and it just is uniform across, so no problem. But when the short channel MOSFET comes in, you can see the depletion regions touch and the gate drain voltage now starts to affect the source junction. Right? That becomes a problem. By the way, there's another way to think about this, which I forgot to mention. Look at this. The drain voltage is positive, right? In the channel, the pot local potential is also positive, right? You have very, this is reverse bias. Most of the voltage drops across the reverse bias junction, but something drops across the semiconductor, some small amount, but it's a positive voltage, <coughs> everything up to zero. Now, this is P type, you have a positive voltage. This is N type, which is at zero. You're starting to fall the bias that junction. Very little. Very little, but slowly. If you make that very large, of course, this will get large. Now you have a different problem, right? You're starting to forward by the junction means that the current will flow very easily. You, independent of the gate. You don't need an inversion. You will just, so look at this location right here, right outside that depletion region. You'll get a slight positive voltage, which means that this will start flowing current. Okay, and that's, is a problem because that current is, and that's a drain to source current, even you know, it basically goes from here. Okay? That current is independent of the gate, you cannot control it, it's going through the body. And that's a leakage current. It's a big problem too. Okay? Heating, heating and loss of battery life and all that stuff. Okay, so that's one important point there as well. From an energy barrier perspective, another way to look at look at this is you can put, plot the electron potential energy as a function of the drain voltage, okay? As a drain for a short channel, for the long channel, nothing happens, okay? Your energy barrier is high all the way through the cha channel, which means that the electron cannot go from source to drain, the opposite way, okay? But once you have a short channel, this en when these depletion regions touch, another way to think about this is this energy barrier now gets lowered which means that the electron sitting on the n-type source can now jump across this barrier and reach the drain, independent of the gate. Okay, so you have a current which cannot be controlled by the gate. It's always on, that's a problem. Okay, so that's another big issue. So this turns out to be a huge challenge in short channel MOSFET, so you should be aware of this. Oops. Okay. So that basically brings us to the end of chapter six. Okay, Just so remember from MOSFETs, make sure you're very clear on the qualitative picture of operation, the capacitance derivation, the current voltage, and the transfer voltage characteristics, input output and transfer characteristics. Then a few non-idealities we talked about. Okay, short channel facts drain induced barrier load and so the, So I expect you to be able to do mathematically the current voltage characteristics, transfer characteristics of the trans, you know, transconductance, all that stuff. And at least the non-idealities I want you to understand qualitatively. You don't need to know that mathematically, okay? So those things make sure you're very clear on because I'll most likely ask you in the final, okay? Okay, so let's move on to the chapter seven, um, which, let's see, is bipolar junction transistors. Okay, so, so we will talk about bipolar junction transistors today and Tuesday, so probably uh, we will, our goal here in this class is to qualitatively understand the operation of these transistors, okay? 
then we will briefly quantitatively describe them, just the current voltage characteristics, and maybe the transfer characteristics. So that's our goal here. So I want you to be able to do this for the final. Okay, make sure you're able to do this. Now, bipolar junction transistors mean the bipolar refers to the fact that their operation depends on both electrons and holes, both positive charges and negative charges. That's why they're called bipolar. Okay, as opposed to MOSFETs, where the current is determined only by one kind of carrier, right? In the case of an N-channel MOSFET, it's the electrons. And you get a P-channel MOSFET, it's just the holes, not together. In a bipolar junction transistor, they operate together. So a bit more difficult to understand. But historically, this was the first one that was invented. <coughs> and uh, Bardeen and co-workers, they uh, won the Nobel Prize for inventing this device. Now, uh, bipolar junction transistors are less common today, you know, uh, overall, but they're still important. They're primarily very important for discrete devices, not integrated devices, okay? And they tend to be much faster in operation compared to MOSFETs, so very, very fast circuits, they're very specialized circuits, uh, high-frequency circuits, and sometimes they're combined with uh, MOSFETs, which is called bi-CMOS, bipolar complementary MOSFETs. So that's the landscape that, that we want to understand. To look at how um, the uh, bipolar junction transistors or BJTs operate, let's qualitatively see what this means, okay? So let's say we have essentially a PN junction. Okay, you have a PN junction connected to a battery and a load. So I have an exercise for you again. How does the current versus voltage of a reverse bias PN junction look? So first of all, this is reverse bias. You have P, N, the negative goes there, plus B goes there. How does the current volt? Take out a piece of paper, draw. For this circuit, as you increase the voltage, what is the current? Okay, this you should be able to do it because we've done this before. Okay. For instance, for the final, I would expect you to know this as well, even though I know this is on chapter three or four, right? But, but this is important to understand BJT, so you should know this. So in a reverse bias junction, the hint is that in a reverse bias junction, what happens to the current? It's essentially constant, right? It doesn't depend on the voltage. So you know what the current is. What is the current? It's just the reverse saturation current, right? As long as it's not in breakdown and all, yeah, as long as your voltage is not super high, right? This is reverse saturation current. And the voltage across the load resistor is just that current times that resistor. Right? So as you increase the voltage, what happens to the current? Nothing. It's constant. Okay? All the voltage essentially drops. Well, the extra voltage drops primarily across the resistor. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? So as it, because it's reversed bias, the current is constant, it's independent of the voltage. Okay, that turns out to be important here. Okay. Now, if you, so with that understanding, what if you are able to create, so the reason this uh, current here is constant has to do with the fact that when this is reverse bias, it's not no carrier generation. The current that essentially comes across, it's like the reverse bias direction is whatever tunnels through and so on, a very small current. That's why it's independent of voltage. Okay. Now, what if you're able to somehow create carriers within that junction region? Okay. If you're able to do that, then of course you can change the current that flows. Okay. So if somehow in a reverse bias PN junction, I can introduce extra carriers somehow, then by introducing more or less carriers, I can control that reverse saturation current. Okay? So instead of having a... So this voltage is the current 
basically constant, right? It was five. But if I can introduce carriers, I can change that. I can make it go up, I can make it come down. If I'm able to introduce carriers into the <coughs> into the junction region. And that's what we will do. That's essentially what a BJT does. Okay? It's essentially a current controlled constant current source. Okay? So if you think back from an equivalent circuit for the MOSFET, what we had was a current source, right? ID, which was controlled by a gate voltage. So voltage controlled current source is what we had for the MOSFET. Plus, we had all the parasitic uh, capacitors we see. Let's ignore that for now. But the BJT is also a current source. The output is also a current, as we will see. But this current, an emitter current, we'll come to that, is now controlled essentially by another current, not a voltage. So it's a current controlled current source. So that's, the, that's one difference. Keep in mind. So the only difference, again, is that I'm somehow introducing some carriers into the junction region, which allows me to control the reverse bias current of a PN junction. Okay, so far, pretty straightforward. Now, of course, what, how do we introduce that carriers? Okay. So in the case of a PN junction like this, you can introduce either electrons or holes. It doesn't matter. But let's try to introduce holes. Okay. A good way to introduce holes, obviously, is we didn't really talk much about it, but you had a guest lecture from Mike Scarpola, who probably talked about it. It's just by shining light. When you shine light, you create electron hole pairs. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another, of course, shining light is not very easy when you are in a chip, in a package, right? You cannot shine light. Uh, so you want to do this electrically. You want to have some sort of hole injection from a battery. Okay? A good hole injector it's a forward bias PN junction, right? A PN junction under forward bias will inject majority carriers, right? The, from the P to the M type. I mean, remember, go back, think about our PN junctions. So that's exactly what we will do. We will introduce a PN junction here, which will inject holes. And that injection is controlled by a current. And that's essentially the operation of the PJT. So this uh, is what I drew there. So this is the current voltage characteristics. If I'm able to increase the whole injection, the reverse saturation current here, of course, can be increased. Okay, it's, I drew it the opposite way, but obviously it's reverse saturation, so it should be drawn like shown here, right? It's reverse bias P injection. Okay, is that clear? So like I said, we will introduce a PN junction to increase that whole injection, which shifts that curve. Okay. And obviously, from an operational point of view, that's exactly the same as having this, right? Essentially, if you ignore the linear part, it's exactly the same as having this, right, under saturation. So it's also an amplifier. Okay, if, I'm get, if I can get a uh, voltage current curve like this, then I can use this as an amplifier. But now the current as input, not voltage. Okay, that's what a bipolar junction transistor is, basically, from an operational point of view. Of course, from a, an actual mechan mechanistic point of view, it's, it's a bit more complicated, and we need to understand that. Okay? So the, the, um, the summary is that the whole injection can now control the current. Instead of, so this is analogous to having a gate voltage controlling the current through the inversion channel. But now the whole injection controls the current. Okay. So, uh, as I said, to summarize, the BJT is an ideal, in the ideal case, a current-controlled constant current source. The output current is almost independent of the load, which is also an important parameter, right? So if you have a current source, which is a constant current source, it's like a battery. Right? If you connect it to something, you don't want that current to be affected by it. Right? That's, the, that's the purpose of a constant current source, right? You want to be able to control it, not based on what it's connected to. 
right? In other words, its impedance being outside should be very large. Okay? Shouldn't change based on what the load resistor is. Okay? And that's exactly what it does. It's the same as a MOSFET. The same issue has ha happens for a MOSFET as well. But for the MOSFET, of course, it's a voltage control current source. So they're both current sources. Okay. So the, let's look at the actual mechanism of how that works. So in terms of the device itself, this is what it looks like, okay? So let's just look at the PN junctions first. So if you ignore that part for the time being, okay? This PN junction here is what we just saw, okay? This is the reverse bias PN. So if you just look at this circuit here, this is exactly what we just saw, okay? You have a PN junction, which is reverse bias, and you have a load resistor, okay? All we have done is we have introduced this PN junction here. We put a P plus in contact with that N, okay? And that's forward biased, which allows you to inject holes in. This idea, okay? So if you go back to this picture, all we have done is introduce another PN junction right here, very close to this. We've just put a P plus right here, basically, and forward biased it. Okay, now let's put some names to these things. So there are three terminals again, just like a MOSFET, it's a transistor. It has what's called an emitter. Okay, that's the control terminal. That's where the whole injection happens from. Okay, for now, we'll actually change that. It depends on the configuration, actually. Then we have a base, okay, B, shown here. That can also be the control, we'll talk about that. Then we have a collector, which collects the, the carriers. Okay, C. So you have three terminals. <coughs> so um, this PN junction is reverse biased. This PN junction is forward biased. So you can see what happens is that when you forward bias this PN junction, this P plus will inject holes into the end base region. And if the end base region is very thin, those holes can very quickly diffuse across to the P collector region, okay? And that forces the current. So by injecting holes here, you can control the reverse current that happens here, which is exactly what we did here. So if you look at the collector current, okay, this current here, which is the reverse bias PN junction current, so it should be independent of the voltage, as a function of the base collector voltage, which is the reverse bias voltage, it's independent, it's a straight line, okay? Reverse bias PN junction. But it can be moved up and down simply by increasing the whole injection, which is coming from the emitter current, okay? So you have three currents to keep in mind, and you can apply Kirchhoff's law, right? You have an emitter current coming in here, base current going out here, collector current going on. So IB plus IC should be IE, right? That's good cost So you have to be careful about this. The actual mechanism of how this works is, is a little more complicated, but let's, let's start from here. Okay. So first, we see obviously that the end re base region in the center must be relatively small. If it's large, any holes that are injected from the emitter to the base will recombine. Right? Because the holes appearing in an n-type material, lots of electrons, they will recombine quickly. So you have to make the base really tiny so the holes actually get across without recombining. So that's the first requirement. You have to make the base end region really small. This WP must, must be small. Okay? Once the holes get across to the n-type, they diffuse. Right? Diffusion happens because you get a high concentration. Remember? Our forward bias P injunction picture. P and if it's forward bias, the holes will get across, so you have a diffusion in the region. Right? When you forward bias it, you decrease that contact potential barrier. The hole gets across. There's an electric field here which pushes the holes to this side. Okay. Over here, if you plot the concentration of the excess holes, remember we did this. It goes like that, right? This is we solve the diffusion equation, all that. 
This is a result of recombination with excess hole electrons here, the holes in the electrons, and diffusion. Because there's a high concentration of excess holes here, they start diffusing, right? they diffuse. But I, if I make my n-type region really small, I just make it this big, <coughs> then almost all of them essentially diffuse across without recombining. Okay? Once they reach this depletion region, it's p-type on this side, right? you will see another electric field which will sweep it across. So that's the mechanism, what happens to the holes. So make sure you follow what happens to the holes. Again, this, this junction is hold by, so the hole gets injected across by lowering the barrier. Okay, there's an there's electric field which pushes it into the base, and type base. Here, diffusion happens to the junction. Then again, it gets swept across. And then after that, it will, it will just uh, diffuse and drift, right? It will just be tight, majority of the time. So to calculate this current is a bit more complicated than that for the MOSFET. Okay. Okay, so um, as I said, there are two ways. You can use either the emitter as the control. In this case, the emitter is the control, right? You're changing the emitter current and changing this curve. Or you can also use the base as the control, which we'll see in a second. When the emitter is used as a control, this is called a common base configuration because the base Terminal is common to both the emitter and the collector. You can see that point right there. Okay, so the BJT is a little more flexible in how you use it. You can connect different things and do different different things with it. So okay, so just to summarize, I want you to think about what I said. There are three terminals for a transistor. What are the input, output, and control in this particular case? Okay, what's the input? No, it's not the emitter base. What is the input? Uh, in this case, you're right. Actually, it is the emitter base. My mistake. Sorry. So do you, does everybody see that? The emitter current, that's the input. No, sorry, my mistake. Well, emitter is the control. I'm getting confused. Yeah. So, so let's start again. What is the input, output, and the control for this? For this device, I say. Okay. The control in this case is emitter current, because that's changing the transconductance, the amplification factor, right? Output, in this case, is IC, the collector current. And in almost all the cases, IC is typically the output. And the input is just, what I mean by input is just the, bi is the bias voltage, like the drain voltage in a MOSFET. That's less important. That, that, in this case, you can think about that as the, either the base current or the base collector voltage doesn't matter in this case, right? In this case, the base current is not important, right? Do you see that? So the base current is just IE minus IC, right? It just comes from Kirchhoff. So it has no, no effect on the operation. It's the IE and the IC that are important in this case, okay? Now, of course, to use this as a switch, you need to have an input, right? A switch needs an input. And that input is clearly that, because you can turn the current on and off, right? You can either make it reverse biased or forward biased. And you can also switch with the emitter current as well. So it's, it's, again, it's a bit more complicated than what, I, what I'm showing here. But imagine just for this particular example, I want you to just understand for this example. Okay, okay so let's Look more closely at what goes to what constitutes the current. Because remember our logic when we were studying MOSFETs, where we were we studied the big picture, and then we looked at how the carriers uh, <coughs> behave through the different sections of the MOSFET, and then we tried to calculate the current from it. We had the drift current, diffusion current, hole current, electron current, all that stuff. So we need to do a similar sort of thing here. Okay, well, let's do this qualitatively first. Okay, first. Um, the current has many components, like I said. So let's just walk through this picture first, okay? So you have an emitter current that comes in. That's the primary control, so let's start there, okay? Holes get injected across this junction, so P plus N junction, okay? Because the barrier is lowered. 
This hole, there are two things that can happen to the holes here. One is it can recombine with electrons here, as shown by this arrow, or it can diffuse across the junction here. Okay, of course you want them, most of them to diffuse across, because that's what gives you the current. Once it diffuses across, it becomes part of the collector current. Okay, so that's what happens to the holes from the emitter. So that's pretty straightforward. Now let's look at what happens to the electrons coming from the base. Okay, this electrons come in because the base current is going out, electrons come in. Electrons come in, again, there are two things that can happen to these electrons. They can recombine with the excess holes here, or they can go across this forward bias junction. This is forward bias, so electrons can go from N to P. Okay, two things that can happen. Now let's think more about what happens to this junction. This junction, remember, is reverse biased, right? Collector base junction is reverse biased, but you can still get small current from the reverse saturation current. You can have minority carriers. So in this case, electrons from the p-type go across to the n-type, and holes from the p-type go across to the and p from the n-type go across to the p-type. Right? That's just the reverse saturation current tunneling and all that, which we are familiar with. So those are the five main components of current that we need to deal with. So it's a bit more complicated in the master. Okay. But let's again look at this qualitatively. First of all, for an ideal BJT, we want to avoid a few things. We want to avoid this recombination, okay, because that's hard to control, meaning all the holes that come from the emitter to the base, you want it to go across to the collector. You don't want to lose any of those holes in the base, which the way to do this, of course, is to make the base really small, really thin, physically thin. Okay, that's the first thing. Yes? With light filtering the base also helps? Yes, that would help as well. Yeah, it's another way to look at it. Base is typically lightly doped. So if you look at this configuration, there are two things uh, you will see. First of all, it's not symmetric. It's not like a MOSFET, right? It's a P plus and P junction. One is heavily doped, and that's the emitter. It's heavily doped, why? Because that's giving you the whole injection. More heavily doped, lower the forward bias you have to be to get the whole injection to happen. Okay, that actually affects the transconductor. Yeah, your amplification factor. Okay. So it's not symmetric, first of all. And you can see that the N and P here are usually lightly doped. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Also. Um, yeah, the other thing you want to avoid, of course, is uh, you want to uh, reduce this effect here. And also this. The reason to avoid this effect has to do with the fact that the reverse saturation current here, shown here, has a slight dependence on the voltage. That's that little curve we see. Okay, the IV curve with the MOSFET on, on the pH junction. This part right here. So you want to minimize that as well. You don't want any uh, effect on the voltage. Yeah, of course, the other thing is this: these electrons that get injected across this junction are also problematic because they will recombine with the holes over here and can reduce the whole injection. So you want to minimize that as well. So for a good BJT, the only thing you want to happen is essentially whole injection and essentially all the holes to go across. That's it. You don't want anything else to really happen. Okay, and that's the challenge. So uh, exercise for you. Okay, I want you to draw this picture for an NPN BJT. Take out a piece of paper and draw. It's a... Uh, Almost identical, but this, so this is P and P, draw N plus P N. Okay, so I'll get you started, but starting point should be, you have N plus emitter, there is in P base, and then collector. Okay, so you have here, here, here. This is uh, collector current, this is base current, this is emitter current. I'm not drawing the directions because I want you to figure it out. It'll have the same analogous current component. So take a minute and draw the component.
The other hint to keep in mind is that this p-n junction is reverse biased. This p-n junction is forward biased. That'll let you draw the terminals, battery terminals. Okay? So start there first. Draw the batteries. Okay, so the, the, the terminals for the battery uh, should be straightforward. So this, <coughs> of course, must be reversed by, so you put the negative terminal here, positive terminal here. You can put a load resistor there. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. And the current direction? Yes, going in. Okay. <coughs> Over here, it's forward by, so this should be negative, positive. You can put a resistor there. And the current here should be going up. Yeah. So now you should be able to tell. We don't know that yet. Talk in a minute. You should be able to tell. Actually, you do. Remember, the injection always comes from this junction, which means that which direction is the base current? Actually, you do know enough. You don't need to know the details. It, this, so the logic is the following, right? The emitter is always the maximum current. It's always larger than the collector. The emitter is the control. Okay, and you are always losing some carriers along the way, so the emitter, in absolute terms, is always larger than the collector. So the base has to come in. In this case. Okay. In other words, the emitter is... Okay. Just a quick up. Right. Now let's think about what's going on here. First of all, the injection part. That's the easy part. So what's going on? What gets injected? Electrons or holes? Electrons. Because they're entire. Yeah. In which way? This way, right? So first, electron injection happens. Some of these electrons we combine with the holes. Hopefully, most of the electrons go across to the collector then go through. So okay, so I said consistent with this, there's electrons are going out, current is coming in. Okay, that's consistent. Same thing here, electrons going this way, current going this way. Consistent. 
Okay? These electrons have to, they combine with holes. And those holes have to come from somewhere. You cannot just recombine and just stick it out, right? Because if you take away holes from here, remember this region is neutral, if you start taking away hole pair recombination, then this whole thing becomes negatively charged. Okay? So that becomes a problem. We'll talk about that too very soon. So the holes have to come from somewhere. They come from here. So that's consistent with that. Holes coming in, current coming in. Is there anything else we need to think about? This small reverse bias section, right? So some holes come this way, some electrons come this way. That's negligible typically, so we don't need to worry too much about it. And then the forward bias means that there's going to be holes from the base. Three. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. So some of the space current actually goes this way. Also, it's small, hopefully, in an ideal situation. Okay? So make sure you're clear on the logic of how the current is distributed. Because next week, we'll do the math. That's a, it gets complicated. Okay? All right, so let's... Oops, I'm going too slow. So now let's try to do a very simple quantitative analysis. Okay, very simplified. We don't, we're not going to do any diffusion. Very simple analysis, okay? So the first thing, we go back to our picture we had before. You have an emitter, base, collector, okay? Now, the output is a collector. We say is some proportionality constant times the whole component of the emitter current, okay? In other words, this is what we just drew. The holes coming from the uh, emitter to the base, most of them make it across to the collector. And that makes it the collector current. Some of them recombine. So this B is not one. If it was an ideal BJT, the collector current will be equal to the whole component of the emitter current. Okay, so that's a very simple, almost qualitative equation. Okay? Now, the whole IEP is the whole component of the emitter current, which is just this part here, whatever is injected across the forward bias junction. And B is the proportionality factor, which is also called the base transport factor. It's essentially the efficiency with which the holes that enter the base leave the base without recombining. Okay? You want that to be 100%, ideally. You want all the holes to basically go through without recombining. Okay? This is a fraction of injected holes that make it, make it across to the collector. Okay, now, the role of the emitter, of course, is to provide those holes. So we can define an efficiency for the emitter, okay? So you want the emitter current here to be primarily holes, but of course, it's a small electron component coming the other way because it's a reverse bias junction. But this is P plus, so we expect the whole component to be much higher, okay? The emitter injection efficiency is then defined as the whole component of the emitter current divided by the total emitter current. Okay, you want that efficiency gamma to be very high, which means most of that current you want it to be by injection uh, of holes. Okay, so those two very important parameters. From emitter to collector, okay, emitter to collector, you can define a current transfer ratio. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good question. Yeah. So you tell me, what is the output current? It's still the collector. Okay. Okay. Take, ignore that for the time being. This is the reverse bias the injunction. Same as our old picture, right? If you don't have this injection, this collector current is independent of everything, independent of the flag voltage is constant, right? Just the reverse saturation current. The only way to control this is by injecting electrons here. Exactly. That's the control. And the output. The thing that's controlled is the output. It's a collector. The collector current is always the output for a BJT. So it's easy to remember. That the base or the emitter can be, either of them can be controls. Okay? And we'll talk, for now, we're only talking about the emitter as the control. On Tuesday, we'll talk about the base as the control. Okay, so. The other parameter to worry about is the amplification factor, right? So, like I said, uh, like Mariana pointed out, the IC is the output, collector current. The, the control is IE, the emitter current. So one can define a 
transfer characteristic or a transconductance for collector divided by emitter, right? That's the same as transconductance when we had drain current divided by gate voltage. Same equivalent thing. Okay, it's easy. So it just becomes B times the emitter current. B times B divided by uh, B times IEP divided by the total emitter current. You just get B times gamma. So it's just the product of this B times this gamma. So it is as all it depends upon in the simple model is how efficiently do the holes cross the base and how much of the emitter current is made up of holes. And of course, ideally, you want this to be 100%. First of all, you will notice that this alpha, or B times gamma, cannot be larger than 1. Okay. So the question for you is, is this amplification? No, right? Because the signal you send in is what comes out is not larger than the signal. It's smaller, typically. Okay, so you, this, this is why you re typically don't use the common base configuration for as an amplifier. You use what's called a common emitter configuration, which we'll talk about in the next class. But Oh, actually, here. Let's see. Okay, we can briefly introduce this. So to do... Uh, so let's introduce the parameters first. To understand amplification in an ideal BJT, um, we can, of course, start looking at the base current. Okay, so I told you base is the key to amplification, so let's try to understand that first. So the base current is given by two components by this picture, right? You have some component going across here, some component going down here for recombination. So that's what this is. So this IEN is the injection of electrons into the emitter, which is this part right here, forward bias junction plus recombination in the base, okay? That's essentially one minus B times IEP because B times IEP is all the holes that go across. Whatever did not make it across, of course, recombine. So that should be equal to the base portion of the recombination curve, okay? So from that perspective, that's the total base current. Pretty straightforward. So now you can define collector current divided by base current, IC over IP which we can call output characters, uh, sorry, yeah, output characteristics, as opposed to transfer characteristics, okay? That turns out to be an expression like this. If you simplify it, you get something like that. Alpha divided by one minus alpha, where alpha was the previous transconductance we calculated, okay? This beta, now alpha divided by one minus alpha, is called the base to collector current amplification, okay? Base to collector, current amplification. Now you can see alpha for an ideal BJT is what? Is one. Okay? Alpha means essentially how efficiently does the hole come here and end up here? And how, how much this current is very low? Okay? So when alpha goes to one, what happens to beta? becomes very large. So there's your amplifier. So now it tells me that I need to put my signal to the base current and read out in the collector current. Right? I can get huge amplification. And that's exactly how you use the BJT as an amplifier. OK? OK, we'll stop here today. I want you to review this part because next class we'll look at something a bit more quantitatively. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll finish it up next week and we'll talk about chapter nine. We only have three more lectures, I think, or two more. But remember, one big announcement is that the final, I changed the final starting time to 9 a.m. Okay, keep that in mind. Nine to ten, yeah, one hour. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how electrons or anything can both